All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. All who have cause to plead, draw near, give attention, you shall be heard. God save these United States, great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, Supreme Court of Florida, please be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. Our first case today is Steele versus Commissioner of Social Security, number 22-1342. We're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Chief Justice Munez, fellow justices of the Supreme Court, May it please the court. My name is Roger Plata, and I'm from St. Petersburg, Florida. I represent the appellant with regard to this case. This case stems from an application for, for children's insurance benefits under Social Security law. The Social Security Administration denied that application at every stage, and the U.S. District Court agreed with that position. The case is currently on appeal to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. The 11th Circuit, in order to render a decision on the appeal, has certified two questions to this court. Counselor, can I ask you about the first kind of provided for issue? I think generally when I, you think about provided for, you think that there might be something in the will that's left to someone. Um, you know, for instance, I leave Jamie uh, $5,000 uh, and not just naming me right not just mentioning me uh, but actually providing something for me can you point in this will where you think it best indicates that this child was provided for in that sense or, or were they i believe that in article one of the will mr Steele specifically states that the term children and lineal descendants shall include those later born or adopted, and whenever used in this instrument shall be equivalent to blood relationship and relationship to adoption. Counsel, I don't think you're answering the question. What did the children, what did the child get under the will? There, I believe that the property passed directly to the mother, to the appellant, at the time that, that the gentleman died. The gentleman died in 2013, or 2011 rather. The child was born in 2013. There is no direct statement with regard naming, to naming the child who was not yet in existence. However- So there's no, there's no bequest and there's no devise to the child? Specifically, no. However, I we would take the position that this is a later born child and Mr. based upon the evidence from the lawyer who prepared the will, Mr. Adcock, as well as the fertility doctor who um, performed the procedure, which was the in vitro fertilization, that this was intended by Mr. Steele to have the product, the child from the in vitro fertilization um, to be the child that was provided what's, for. What's the relevance of that intent? The relevance of that intent is that the position, th that in analyzing what does provided for mean. And I think that it is important to know exactly what was said to the lawyer who prepared the will. What's, what's your best case for the proposition that when we're trying to figure out what the text of a will means, we look to the uh, extra textual statements of intent by the testator's lawyer and the testator's physician? I don't have a, a, a case directly on that point, Your Honor, but the, our position would be that provided for under Merriam-Webster's dictionary, 
would state that that is providing for something that will happen in the future. And in this case, that is what happened. The child was a later born child. And the basis, therefore, the intent and knowledge that the preparer of the will, that is Louis Adcock, an exceptional lawyer, former president of the St. Pete Bar Association, former member of the Board of Governors of the Florida Bar, has told us what he thought Mr. Steele intended when well, he but, prepared the will. But counsel, I mean, there's no question that a will could make specific provision for um, a posthumously conceived child and leave and, and make provision for that child and you know, leave something to the child, make a bequest or a device to that child. No question that that could be done, right? That could have been done, yes. And there's no question that that wasn't done in this will. It wasn't done in that manner. I what I believe was the usage of the term later born is significant. But, but, the, but the, at the end of the day, the child gets nothing under this will. Nothing. He wasn't in existence at the well, that's I understand fine. that, but okay. <laughs> but I, I I'm struggling to understand how um, a will that leaves nothing to the child can be said to be a will that uh, made provision for the child. Our position, and and looking at the letter that I received when I, I wrote Mr. Adcock about this, was that he believed that this was a planned pregnancy that Mr. Steele was aware of his health and age, that he wanted uh, to preserve his sperm so they could be used based upon the new science that we have, where children can be um, come into existence and be conceived after the death of a person, that he wished that, to, that Mr. Steele intended that to be done. We also have the statement which the judge from the 11th Circuit specifically quoted to you in the letter or in the opinion uh, at page four of her opinion, which said that Dr. Pabone, that's the doctor who performed the um, in vitro fertilization procedure, Dr. Pabone states, and I quote, or first, that Mr. Steele had, quote, documented his desire for his wife to use the sperm for a future conception even if he were to be incapacitated or deceased. What I am saying to this court is that I believe based upon the statements from Mr. Adcock and from Dr. Pabone and the use of the term later born in the will that that's what Mr. Steele intended to have done. But counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but so you're asking us to read provided for as the same as just acknowledge the possible existence of. Well, that would be right. I mean, the procedure would have to be successful. It would have to be performed. And that's why the statute. Isn't that kind of an unusual, I mean, in this context? I mean, the provided for in this context refers to taking care of, leaving money to, et cetera. I mean, just to, so I mean, it seems like under the logic of your position, if it said, you know, I know that there's a possibility that there will be, you know, posthumously conceived children, but I want them to take nothing under this will. Under your theory, they would be, quote unquote, provided for because their existence would have, their possible future existence would have been acknowledged. Yes, and I think the important thing here is looking at the statute, looking at uh, 742.174. The reason, I believe, why this statute, which was created 30 years ago, was, perform was created by the Florida legislature, was to be in line with the new science of the time, that, the, a, that this would be permissible if the three criteria in section 742.174 were present. They are that there was a commissioning couple. That's what we have, Mr. and Mrs. Steele, who were intended to be the parents of the child. Secondly, we have an in vitro fertilization procedure, which based upon the new science 
would allow a child to be con conceived even after the death of the decedent. And then, of course, there is the requirement of provided for. But one of the, the really major points that the state of Florida makes in their brief to this court is that it is the writing. There should be something connecting the child with the testator. And what I do believe you have here with a child who is not in existence, is not named, but it was intended that if there was a later born child, that he would be provided, that child would be provided for in a will. And I think based upon the, the new science and what we have, remember, please, your, and I'm addressing the court and your honor, is that this was done, the will was created in 2010. The science has gone beyond that. The statute in question was created in 1993. And it was designed, I believe, to help our courts be able to distribute property uh, to children who, who are, have come into existence by, by way of in vitro fertilization. Sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You need to wrap up. And you can have one minute for rebuttal. Okay. It is the position of the appellant that based upon the will itself, what it states, the statements from Mr. Adcock, which are in the record, and the statement of Dr. Pabon, most notably, which was referred to by the 11th Circuit, plus... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. <clears throat> Derek Monson on behalf of the state. The Florida legislature enacted section 742.174 to prevent a decedent's reproductive cells from being used contrary to his wishes um, to, to conceive children who could then mount attacks on the decedent's estate. But if the decedent left a will um, reflecting an intent to have and provide for posthumously conceived children, then that concern um, is suddenly no longer present. So the legislature granted children in those circumstances the same rights uh, that any other child ordinarily has under Florida law. How against. much of your position here depends on the words have and provide in your sort of introduction there? I mean, if, if we decide here that the will does not speak clearly at all to a decision to provide for any child or indeed to have any specific child, what's the state's position on, on the rest of the issues before us. So, so the, the, the state agrees that if the will does not provide for the child within the meaning of section 742.174, then that the child would not have intestate inheritance rights under, under this statute. Um, What's the state's view, if any, on what it means to provide for someone under so the statute? The state did not take a position in, in the brief, so I'd be hesitant to take one at oral argument. Um, about, but specifically, uh, that, that phrase means, um, as far as you know, wh whether or not it re requires an actual provision of property in the will, or whether or not it just requires a provision reflecting an intent um, to conceive, posthumously conceive children, um, the state hasn't taken a position on that. But reg regardless, uh, whatever the statute ultimately requires, the state does agree that that is the condition that must be met before the, the child can um, enjoy intestate inheritance rights. But uh, the, the commissioner's reading um, would, is that e even if the child is provided for in the will, that the child does not have any of the rights that a child has under Florida law against the, dece the uh, deceased parent's estate. Should we be concerned at all that you're asking us to read a fairly broad right um, granted in sort of this slightly unclear sentence um, that's not in any of the statutes that we would normally look at, right? I mean, it's not in the probate code. It's, it's a completely separate statute. It's a fairly broad right. And in, maybe even more so, there's no limitations or restrictions, right? There's, there's no time limit. I mean, 50 years later, someone could, under your theory, show up and ask for this right. Is, does that concern the state at all, that it seems very broad uh, in, in the way you're asking us to interpret it? Um, what, are, what is your, your response to that? 
Um, so first, I don't know that I, that I agree that it's necessarily broad. Um, so the statute does um, impose limitations on uh, a posthumously conceived child right, right to inherit. Um, they, so they do have to be provided for in the will. It does also limit um, this, this benefit to children. So a, a posthumously conceived grandchild or um, any, any other type of heir is not, is not entitled um, to, to inherit intestate property. Um, second, I, I would also um, disagree that this, this code is one that we don't look to um, to answer questions like this. I think that the domestic relations code and the uh, probate code are, are often going to interact. So the, the domestic relations code establishes uh, familial relationships, which then obviously has bearing on inheritance rights uh, under, under Florida law. And I actually think that that uh, is an important point about why uh, this statute does um, what, what the state says it, it does. Um, it's, it's placement in the domestic relations code in a chapter titled Determination of Parentage. What, what do we do about the fact that any child conceived in this manner is just as a function of the the, the way marriage is extinguished upon the demise of either person, right? It's till death do we part. Mm -hmm. um, what do we do about the fact that any child conceived this way is, I think, born out of wedlock? And there is substantial provision, including in 742091 um, and 742210, about um, the effect of wedlock on, the, per, on, the, on the, the sort of child's status in the family code. Right. Um, it seems like your reading of the statute just sort of wipes all that away. Help me reconcile your position with that. So I think if there, if there was a dispute about the parentage of the child, that would also certainly have to be established um, in this case. Well, leave aside parentage, yeah. right? Let's, I mean, here we can, for example, say that there is no dispute as to parentage. The question's about wedlock. Right. So, so I think the, the more relevant statute for cases of assisted reproductive technology is uh, section 742.14. Um, which uh, determines how, how you establish parentage when a child is born with assisted reproductive technology. Um, and that statute says that the, a, a donor, so the source of the reproductive cell. I, I'm not hearing an answer to my question, though, and I really want you to focus on it. Mm -hmm. um, let's say that parentage is not at issue. I'm asking, what is, the, what is the effect of the state's reading on the portions of this statute that speak to wedlock? So I don't I don't know that the the portions of the statute um, dealing with wedlock are necessarily interact um, or, or have the same force when dealing with um, children that are born with assisted reproductive technology. Why? So, Why should we read those provisions of the statute out of existence? Because the 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 statute so 742 um, 742.14 says that the 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 parents of a child born through assisted reproductive technology are the, the intended, the, the commissioning couple. And section 742.13 defines the commissioning couple as the intended parents of the child. Yeah, but all of that presumes, doesn't it, that the commissioning couple is consistent with um, some sort of form of live birth. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm, the reason I'm, I'm asking you to focus on this is um, it seems to me problematic that the state in this case is urging a reading of the statute that essentially causes us to close our eyes to half of this, this code and pretend like it's not there, when perhaps the legislature just needs to address how these two things interact and the state should concede that. Yeah, so I, I, the, the reason I, I don't know that the, the statute's dealing with, with marriage necessarily um, apply in the same way is because uh, so, so obviously, the commissioning couple doesn't have to be married uh, to, to conceive a child through assisted reproductive technology. So if you have an unmarried couple that commission uh, the conception of a child through assisted reproductive technology, and they've established that intent, then under 742.14, they are the parents of the child. And I think 742.17 is just merely the extension of that principle applied when one of the parents is deceased. Um, so if, if the will reflects that, that the parent intended uh, to, to, to be the parent of the child, in, in other words, they were part of the commissioning couple, then the parent is, they've established parentage, uh, assuming that they've also established genetic parentage, if that's in dispute. 
um, and the child has, then, then they get all the rights that come with establishing the legal parent-child relationship. Can, can Counsel, let me, let me ask you about the relationship between uh, Section 742.17 and the probate code. Mm -hmm. Now, you would concede that it is a derogation of the probate code, provisions of the probate code, correct? That it's an in derogation of provisions? Well, it's of? inconsistent. You're, that your interpret, I should, let me yeah. clarify, your interpretation of it would be inconsistent with provisions in the probate code. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree that, that it adds a, an additional exception to, um, to, to some provisions of the probate code, yes. All right. Now, I don't think anybody's talked about this, but in the probate code, isn't there uh, an overarching provision, a rule of construction against implied repeal that says that this code is intended as unified coverage of the subject matter, Mm -hmm. And this is within the subject matter, intestate succession, and no part of it shall be impliedly repealed by subsequent legislation if that construction can reasonably be avoided. So there's going to be a presumption against interpreting any other provision, of subsequently enacted provision of law, in a way that is inconsistent with the provision of the probate code. Isn't that correct? So I, I don't know that, that I would say that this is an implied uh, repeal. So you have, I mean, the, so the probate code establishes that intestate rights vest at the time of death, um, but that's already not a universal rule because the probate code. Well, but there's a specific, there's a specific exception uh, in the probate code for um, heirs of, of, um, of a decedent conceived before. <laughs> his or her death, yes, but born thereafter. Right. Well, this is definitely outside that. Yeah, so I think... So, what we're so, talking about here is something that would be precluded by that specific provision. So I don't know how that gives you much... Uh, you can find much refuge in that provision. Yeah. So, Your Honor, I see my time's expired. If I Go can ahead. Briefly. Thank you. Um, so, so I think the, the posthumously, or the... Sorry, the, the afterborn heir statute is is an exception to that rule, but it doesn't purport to to preclude the legislature from enacting additional exceptions, and it do, also doesn't require that the legislature enact them as part of the probate code. And our position is that uh, the the if then conditional that the statute creates is simply an additional exception for this very narrow class of heirs, posthumously conceived children. Thank you. Can I ask you though? So. Because I'm curious also about the interaction with 742.17.4 and this provision 732.106. And it's interesting that in 17.4, um, it talks about the person dying before the transfer of the egg sperm or pre-embryos. And so you could imagine basically conception having to happen while the person is alive is sort of a hard cap. And then viewing this as kind of an extra requirement that you overlay on 732.106 that says if there is conception while the person is alive but then transfer happens after death, that essentially this the provision for them in the will would be kind of an extra requirement, but it wouldn't do away with the underlying requirement that conception occur beforehand. Could you address that? So <clears throat> section 742.174 doesn't distinguish between uh, an, an embryo that is created before the death or an embryo that was created after the death. So I think the statute says um, any time that the, the, the child is conceived using the sperm or eggs and then the death occurs before the transfer. So I think that that covers situations where the embryo was created before death and then the transfer of the embryo happened after. But I, I but think that also just plainly includes a situation like in, in this case where the embryo was created after the death with the uh, reproductive cells. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Good morning. If it pleases the court, my name is Richard Blake and I represent the Commissioner of Social Security in this matter. Uh, this, came, this case came about because the appellant mother uh, applied for child insurance benefits on the earnings of the deceased father uh, on behalf of the claimant. Uh, 
Uh, the agency denied the child insurance benefits application based on a determination that the claimant could not inherit a, share, a child's share of the wage earner's estate through intestacy under Florida law. Under the Social Security Act and the Commissioner's regulations, an applicant must show that he was the wage earner's child uh, to qualify for insurance benefits. Under the Act, the agency considers an individual to be the child of the wage earner uh, if the child could inherit a child's share of the wage earner's intestate personal property under the law of the state uh, of, in which the wage earner was domiciled at the time of his death. Uh, the, the overarching issue here is whether Florida Statute 742.17.4, uh, which states that pos a posthumously conceived child shall not be eligible for a claim of a decedent's estate unless the child has been provided for by the decedent's will, whether that statute establishes intestacy rights uh, if the decedent's will provided for the child. Uh, now, Florida Statute 742.14.7 uh, establishes it's the only statute addressing uh, intestacy rights, uh, or it does, actually doesn't uh, address intestacy rights, but it's the only uh, statute that it addresses posthumously uh, conceived children or a posthumously conceived child. Um, the statutory language discusses only inheritance rights created through a will, and it omits any mention of the term intestate or intestacy. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have to be the case for your reading uh, to, to sort of make sense um, that provided for can't mean a specific monetary bequest because if it did, then by definition we wouldn't be in intestacy land, right? Yes, um, sir, that's absolutely correct. And that is one of the commissioner's points that uh, the definition, the commonly held definition of intestacy, uh, both under, under the Florida probate code, under uh, the model probate code, and under legal sources and lay sources, all agree that intestacy is in the absence of a will. Well, so, but, counsel, but counsel, the statute says any part of the estate of a decedent not effectively disposed of by will passes to the decedent's heirs as prescribed in the following sections of this code. So it clearly contemplates that there are going to be circumstances where a will uh, disposes of certain property and other property not covered by the will passes by intestate succession. Isn't that correct? I mean, that's uh, obvious. Yes, sir, that is absolutely correct. There, there are many cases where you can have an estate where there's a will that, that disposes of some property and then some property is not named in the will and that any leftover property will pass through intestacy. That's absolutely correct. But that doesn't change the fact that 742.174 uh, only talks about uh, for this child uh, being able, uh, being provided for by the decedent's will. The statute itself states uh, that a child conceived from the egg, sperm, and pre-embryo of a person who died before the transfer of the egg, sperm, or pre-embryo to a woman's body shall not be eligible for a claim against the decedent's estate unless the child has been provided for by the decedent's will. Can I ask you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, so 732.302 talks about pretermitted children and it says when a testator omits to provide by will for any of his or her children born or adopted after making the will. Um, do you think that we need to interpret the provided for language in 742.17.4 the same that we interpret provided by will for any children in 732.302? Well, I think that the difference is that 742.17.4 is specifically talking about uh, a child who's uh, posthumously conceived. Well, not, I guess what I know, but I mean, I understand that it's addressing it in that specific context, but 
I'm wondering if if your position would be that we need to if if far if we do address the provided for aspect of this, do you think that we need to does there do they do we need to be consistent or is it possible that quote unquote provided for in this context could require something different from what we would require in seven thirty two three oh two? I think it is different because because of the nature of of the posthumously conceived child and because of the statute that y'all were discussing earlier, um, which let me go to that, uh, Florida Statute 732.106, which talks about uh, posthumously born children. And that, uh, as I think was pointed out, provides that intestacy, it does specifically talk about so it. So are you aware of any, is there any case that you would point us to that was uh, in the you know, I haven't found anything in the 742-174 context, but is there any case you would point us to for 732-302 that would shed light on how we interpret provided for? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I don't, I don't have any specific case on that. I would just argue and could that... Could you, could you, I mean, it seems like you have a very strong case on, on the, uh, I mean, if provided for means anything like actually leaving something to... Could you just, do you, could you, is it your, is there anything in the will that you think that is even uh, close to providing for the child? I mean. Well, Your Honor, I have the will here, and you know, the uh, language that was, um, that was talked about uh, where, um, in, under the definition of family, um, you know, it talks about, um, the terms children and lineal descendants, including uh, uh, those later born or adopted, and the government, the the commissioner has made the position that uh, by grouping those two terms together, that um, Florida uh, law doesn't recognize adoption rights, uh, for, you know, for deceased. Uh, individual or the ability to adopt for deceased individuals so that this would have to refer to uh, later born or adopted being during the after the the execution of the will but even but I mean you, the, that could only be relevant if you thought that provided for might mean acknowledge the possible existence of I mean if we if we interpret provided for to mean actually leaving something to someone in the will there's no provision that comes close to leaving anything to this, even if you thought that it was referring to this child, it doesn't leave the child anything. Are we right about that? Am I right about that? Well, I did read the, the will, and you're correct. There, it, it, it seems that in this case, everything passed um, to, the, to the wife. There was, there's no specific, I mean, and that again was one of the, the commissioner's arguments, that there's no specific provision either recognizing the child by name or by, even, even by description, um, unless you, you have a very broad description. Of, and then as far as actually uh, leaving a, a specific bequest, I mean, there, there, there's not. Um, in fairness, I, I mean, the only thing I, I mean, you, if, you, if you had a broad reading and you read uh, the child as, as kind of a category. Well, uh, counsel, you want to concede this case? No, sir, I don't. I'm just... I, I, I'm, I'm really struggling with the position of the Social Security Administration because you, this, this point about whether there's a provision made for the child in the will is something that you've kind of just kind of circled around and talked about the definition and and this issue about whether something is actually left to the child, you don't seem to be much interested in it, are you? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, in, 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 to your point, sir, there, I mean, the answer is no. There's no provision for the child. It, Do you think that's relevant? Well, it, under the statute, the statute does say that, um, you know, for it to be able to take, to make a claim, you have to be provided for in the, well, of course, sir, that's the, the basic point of the case. That's what we're saying. The He's not, the only way, uh, uh, to be clear, the only way a posthumously conceived child can take under Florida law is if he's provided for in a will. 
The Florida legislature did not provide intestacy rights for post-posthumously conceived children. It excluded them. So you agree that the, that the 742.17.4, the legislature didn't need to enact anything to affirmatively give uh, a testator the right to leave something in their will to a child conceived and born under these circumstances, right? Yes, sir. So is it your position that the only work that this is doing is to cut off intestacy rights? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. So if that's the work that it's doing, why would why would the legislature not have just been explicit and talk about intestacy rather than doing this kind of, you know, by implication? Well, because I believe there was there there were no intestacy rights for post conceived children because as was pointed out, the the child is it come, is coming into existence after the death of the of the person. Uh, the decedent. The well, the, un, I mean, you could be conceived and then transferred after. So that you, it is possible without this to comply with 732.106 if conception happens before death and transfer happens after death. Right, but I think this. I think that 17, uh, 742.174 was the legislature. I think. This was the legislature's attempt. I think what they were getting at, and it, if, it, if it was done inartfully, perhaps, but I think what they were saying, and I think on it, it's I think that it's clear on its face. I, I think that it could be open to interpretation, as the Eleventh Circuit said. But I think that it's clear what they're saying is that this child, this posthumously conceived child, shall not be eligible for a claim against the decedent's estate unless he's provided for in the will. And I think that's the only way. That provision in the will providing for is the only way that a posthumously conceived child can inherit in, in, under Florida law. That's the, the commissioner's position. We think that's the, the wording of the statute and the intent of the legislature. And, you know, I think we see that when we look at uh, 106, because 106 actually does grant intestacy rights, uh, but it makes it clear that those are for um, those intestacy rights are for a child conceived before the decedent's uh, death, but born after, and that's to the conclu to the exclusion of uh, a, a posthumously conceived child. So if uh, the panel has no further questions, uh, I'll rest on the commissioner's brief. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in rebuttal to that, I think it is significant that the Florida statutes are to be read in harmony. When you come to the point of, of having satisfied 742.174, then you look at the statutes with regard to intestate. And what it says is proper, property not effectively disposed of by will goes intestate to the heirs. Who are the heirs? The heirs are specifically those who could take intestate property in the following sections. It states in, in under Florida law that descendants take intestate. Who are descendants? Yeah, but that's determined at the time of death. I mean, if it, if it weren't for 732.106, even someone who was conceived before death wouldn't, wouldn't uh, inherit, wouldn't, point, wouldn't be entitled to the intestacy. My point is, I don't think the Florida legislature intended to, to discriminate between whether you were conceived before or after death and that there are statutes in place in Florida law specifically dealing with intestacy so that the child could take intestacy. Okay, sorry, one last question because your time Thank is you. up. Do you have any case from the pre-dermitted uh, children statute which also uses language about providing for in a will that supports your position? I do not, Your Honor. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor.
Okay, we'll now take up our next case, State of Florida versus Kreller, uh, number 22-524. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. In Pennsylvania versus Mims, the U.S. Supreme Court drew a bright line rule that officers may order an occupant out of a vehicle during a traffic stop. And that rule derived from the reasonableness balancing that governs whether a search or seizure is reasonable under the First Amendment, uh, Fourth Amendment, excuse me. Uh, on one side of that balance, officers have substantial safety risks at a stop. Not only must they be aware of traffic that could be hurtling by at just a few feet away, but they must also be alert to the possibility that the occupant in the vehicle may be armed or that the occupant may use the vehicle as a weapon to harm the officer. And on the other side of that balance, occupants who are lawfully detained during a stop have diminished interests in liberty and privacy. Not only has their freedom of movement been restricted during the stop, but the stop occurs in full public view, mitigating many of the privacy concerns that they might otherwise have. And from that balance, MIMS drew a bright line rule, and that rule applies in this case. And that's because respondent was ordered out of his vehicle by a canine officer during a traffic stop, and MIMS tells us that that kind of exit order is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Now, the second district re resisted that conclusion for two reasons, but neither of those reasons hold up. It first concluded that there was no specific safety risk in this case, but that just doesn't matter because MIMS tells us it doesn't matter. MIMS was a case where there was no specific safety risk. In fact, the officer there simply ordered individuals out of the car as a matter of course, yet still MIMS said, because there are generally safety risks inherent in a traffic stop, and because those risks outweigh the occupant's interest in liberty and privacy, we're going to say that the officer can issue an exit order. So that gets us halfway there, but why don't we just square up to Rodriguez? I mean, because uh, let's say we agree with every word you've said so far, uh, the occupant is ordered out of the vehicle. Is it the state's position that the occupant uh, could stand there uh, for three hours uh, after the um, uh, ticket has been issued to facilitate a dog sniff? No, that's absolutely not the state's position because Rodriguez tells us that that can't be the case. Okay, so um, uh, sort of going back to the touchstone of reasonableness where you started, um, help us uh, understand the rule the state would have us adopt with respect to um, incentivizing an officer to timely conclude the interaction or whether or not it matters that the interaction be timely concluded. You know, there's, there is this uh, notion in the, in the uh, dissent to Rodriguez that, um, you know, the, the rule adopted by the Supreme Court in that case sort of incentivizes the officer who drags his or her feet a little um, from a general law enforcement standpoint, right? Like from an investigative standpoint, um, you know, take as long as you like to process it. It allows further criminal investigation uh, to happen. What's, what's the state's response to the point made in the Rodriguez dissent about that? Well, I, I, I'll say two things to that. First, I want to be clear that that's not this case because we have a finding that there was no prolongation here, so Rodriguez doesn't apply. But taking the question head on, I think Rodriguez bakes into its analysis that a stop has to be conducted within a reasonable amount of time. So if a stop goes for three hours, that there's just no way that that's going to be reasonably necessary given the facts of the case. Stops typically are pretty fast. Is it the state's position that a dog sniff um, implicates no Fourth Amendment privacy or, or other concern because, you know, a dog sniff is an observation of a uh, environmental factor that a person has no recognized Fourth Amendment interest in, in protecting? Is That's that the right. state's position? That's right, Justice Curiel. That's exactly what Illinois v. Cabayas says. And so here we're just trying to figure out whether this exit order that was issued by a canine officer is reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. MIMS tells us it's reasonable. Now, the only way that my, uh, the second district said that it wasn't reasonable is by asking why did the canine officer take the action? Here the canine officer took the, uh, issued the exit order for the purposes of facilitating the dog sniff and not the traffic stop, but that just runs square into Justice Scalia's holding in Wren versus United States. Because in Wren, Justice Scalia in a nine to nothing opinion for the court said that it does not matter when we are determining an act's reasonableness under the Fourth Amendment what the officer's actual motivations were. 
All that matters is in these general circumstances, is this particular action reasonable under the Fourth Amendment? And MIMS tells us that the answer is yes. Because there was no prolongation in this case, Rodriguez simply does not apply, and MIMS's rule continues to apply. If there are no further questions, I'm happy to cede the balance of my time for rebuttal. Good morning. May it please the court, Pamela Isaacowitz on behalf of the respondent, Joshua Crowler. I'd like to start off by pointing out some facts that were omitted from the state's initial brief and from its argument. There were four officers involved in this case. The first officer, Officer Diaz, saw the traffic infraction. He didn't have the ability to stop the car, stop Mr. Crowler, because he had no riding abilities and no uh, siren or, or lights. So he calls for backup. Uh, Sergeant Coves comes in a car with lights and siren and initiates the traffic stop. At this point, there's two officers. So, uh, Officer Diaz is on the driver's side. Sergeant Coves is on the uh, passenger side of the car. It's December 20th, 2018. It's dark. It's 7 o'clock at night. Officer Diaz is on the driver's side. He asked for Mr. Crowler's information, his license registration. Um, he asked to search the car. Mr. Crowler says no. Officer Diaz then goes back to his car and puts in Mr. Crowler's information into his computer. He calls for a canine officer. At this point, Sergeant Coves walks around the side of the car and goes and stands next to Mr. Crowler by the driver's side. And, in, and testifies in essence that he's just standing there. He's in essence guarding Mr. Kreller. At no point did either Officer Diaz or Sergeant Kreller ask Mr. Uh, ask Sergeant Diaz or or, office, or or Officer Coves ask Mr. Kreller to get out of the car. There was no safety interest as far as the police were concerned at this point. There was no evidence that Mr. Kreller was. But, we, but, but MEMS teaches that there's a categorical safety interest. It doesn't have to be specifically articulated, isn't that correct? Well, that's true, but, but MIMS is not the end of the story here. I don't, I don't disagree that there's more that's been said. Okay, so they, so they could have, had there been an officer safety issue, they could have asked him to get out of the car at that point. And had they done that, I don't think we would be here today. But they didn't do that because there was no officer safety issue. The officer, the officer safety issue only became relevant when the police asked Mr. Kreller to exit the car for, this, for the dog sniff, which has no basis in, there's no, no reason to ask him for the dog well, let's, sniff. Well, let's, let's address, um, you know, uh, you, in, your, in your recitation of the facts, you tell us that they ran uh, the defendant's information, they ran a warrant check. I mean, there's, there was no basis for doing that, and yet, if that delays a traffic stop, it is as a matter of course sort of accepted that that's part of the inquiry, right? So, you know, I, I guess part of the trouble with the, the sort of position in, in your brief, and you might say inherent in the majority opinion in Rodriguez, is this idea that, you know, our primary work here is to decide whether or not officer safety is being addressed. That's, that's certainly a concern, but in a traffic stop, law enforcement does all sorts of stuff that isn't necessarily related to officer safety. It's not like, you know, we, if, if we permit officers the time to run someone's background and determine whether or not they're outstanding warrants, it's not because we're afraid that this person has a warrant out for his or her arrest and is therefore going to be a risk on the road. They're doing law enforcement. And, you know, query whether that's just part of the deal. Law enforcement is acting to, uh, you know, conduct a traffic stop, but they're also doing some law enforcement. They're doing some investigation. Why isn't that just not constitutionally permissible? Well, because under Rodriguez, once the, once the issue of the traffic stop and the importance of the traffic stop is addressed, once his, they realize that there's no warrant, that his license was correct, that he has insurance, that there's no, um, that he wasn't fidgeting, he didn't show any signs that there was any problem with him, that there was no smell of drugs in the car, there was no weapon in the car. Once that is over, then what happened in this case was that they, the police detoured into something else. Which and isn't nothing it, yeah, but isn't but, it their right to detour? Like, I, I guess my question is, how do you respond to the state's uh, position? 
that, for example, an individual has no privacy right in excluding a dog sniff. You can't, you can't, can you say, I'm sorry, I refuse to let your dog sniff me, right? We've held, or not we, the U.S. Supreme Court has held pretty clearly that that's not a search or seizure for Fourth Amendment purposes, right? Yes. Okay. But, the, but, the, but Rodriguez said that once the traffic stop, once the purpose of the traffic stop ends, it detours. But, but the, counsel, but that's all, the, the key word there is once it ends, or the key phrase is once it ends. And what you have here is a, is a conclusion by the trial court and the second district uh, that the officer's uh, testimony um, uh, supported the conclusion that the uh, vehicle sweep did not prolong the stop. That's correct. Okay, and so Rodriguez is all about the prolongation of a stop. It's not about what's going on while the the stop is is has taking place, and the the purpose of the stop is being carried out. It's not about other things that might be happening during that time period. It's about things that happen that prolong that time period, and that's what, that's what causes the trouble if it gets prolonged by other things. But here we have the conclusion of the trial court and the second district that it wasn't prolonged. Now you've kind of. Uh, You've kind of suggested that that's not right, that it was prolonged, but you've really not presented us with anything explaining why the the second district was wrong in their conclusion about that. Well, I don't think the second they didn't the, the timing wasn't an issue as far as the second district was concerned. Well, but you, but, but you're saying the timing is an issue well, no, because you it's because not you in your in your in your brief you argue that the stop was prolonged. Well, it's not the timing that was the issue. It's the fact that it detoured into something that wasn't related to the traffic stop. But in, in Rodriguez, the whole point in the discussion about a detour, it was that it was a detour that resulted in a prolongation, well, was it not? Yes, but they also said that, it, that the dog sniff is not an ordinary incident of a traffic stop, but is aimed at detecting evidence of ordinary criminal wrongdoing. A dog sniff is not part of the officer's traffic mission. Well, we understand that, but we also understand that the dog sniff can be undertaken and accomplished during the length of the stop, as long as the stop is not prolonged. Isn't that correct? That's, that's what the case law says. The, the yes. question yes. that I have, not, because we seem to be going in circles about what the mission was here, the mission here was a traffic stop. Correct. And, and your position is that since the Officer Diaz stood by the defendant, Mr. Clary, in this case, the whole period of time without asking him to have to read the car so because his public safety may have been involved in that type of thing, because he stood there for that long, that that no longer was an issue. But the, the only thing that happens is once this evolved into the, the, the sweep, uh, and the canine officer came, and he told Mr. Clara, look, I've done a bunch of these, and what I'm afraid of is to be walking around your car with my shirt. Uh, did it not, the, the fact that the canine officers do have that issue that people ram them with sure, a car. Sure, and, and nobody's discounting that the, that officer safety issue and dog sniff, I mean, they, they everybody admits, everybody agrees that, that policing is a very difficult and, and problematic issue. Nobody, and the second DCA is not saying that. What the second DCA is saying is that once the reason for the stop had passed, once the reason for the stop, the officer safety issue was no longer an issue, it detoured into something else, and that the police had no reason, reasonable suspicion, or probable cause to ask Mr. Kreller to get out of the car for a dog sniff because there was no reason. reason and, and to drag him out of the car once he said no. Well, there was no uh, that, reason to do that right, because right. they had no evidence that there was drugs in the car, that Mr. Crowler was stopped for anything other than a traffic citation. So once, once the mission, the traffic stop is over with, your position is for them to request him to get out of the car or command him to get out of the car, there has to be some reasonable suspicion that he's involved in some kind of crime. Correct. And there wasn't. 
They didn't see him leaving a drug house. They didn't see him buying or selling drugs. They saw nothing to indicate there was any drugs in the car. They didn't smell any, any drugs in the car. His behavior didn't show as if there was something that he was hiding. He wasn't nervous. He wasn't fidgeting. He was simply stopped for a traffic violation. Is it your position that Mims is that they should have, under the circumstances, asked him for his keys? How, how they yeah, they could have asked him for his I keys. That, but sure. that's not my question. My question is, is it your position that Mims teaches that they should have done that. Isn't the teaching of MIMS to the contrary that the mission of the stop is kind of irrelevant to the question of whether he can be ordered to exit the car? I don't, I don't think that's true. Okay, help me understand that because I don't see that in MIMS. You don't see, MIMS, MIMS created a bright line rule, but the bright line rule is not unlimited. It's not unfettered. They can't just order anybody, they can't just stop anybody for whatever reason, and they can't just order somebody. Not for whatever reason, MIMS, and MIMS acknowledges that. Indeed, Mim says it's not like we can every time you have an interaction with the law enforcement. It's like if, if I'm at a red light and law, the cop next to me rolls down his window and says, good morning, you're right. Mim does not say, does not teach that he can ask me to step out of the car. But if I have a busted taillight or if my registration sure. and, and there's a traffic stop, I think Mim's very squarely teaches that the, the law, office, law enforcement officer is under no obligation to say, sir, please give me your car keys. To the contrary, he the bright line rule is he can say, please step out of the car. Well, he could, but they didn't hear. They didn't hear because there was no evidence that they were on a busy street or that there was any reason for the officers but, to feel threatened. There's nothing in but what you're, it seems like you're suggesting a, a rule that uh, law enforcement, when they do a stop, they have to ask uh, or direct um, the driver to get out of the car at the beginning of the stop. And if for some reason they don't do that and then something develops and they think for that they make a judgment that they want the person out of the car, that they can't do that. They, they're kind of locked in by the way that the encounter starts. And I just think that is, that, that is not consistent with the, the, what, what we know from MEMS and from this notion in the case law that in these circumstances, the law enforcement has, because of the officer safety concerns that are ever present, ever present, they don't go away because the officer did not, at the, at the outset of the, of the interaction, say, get out of the car. They're ever present. And just because they did not act on it then, that they, they somehow lose command of the situation. And um, because we understand from the case law that it's important in these circumstances that are fraught with the potential for violence, that they be able to control the situation to protect themselves. Now, isn't that correct? Yes, that's correct. They need to protect themselves. But in this case, they didn't feel the need to protect themselves. Well, they, but they, they did. Only after the dog sniff came. Only after the dog, the, the, the canine was called. Well, and for we, what reason? But we, but we know that that is permitted. It is permitted for them to do the dog sniff. And wouldn't you concede that having the dog sniff, sniff the car actually potentially raises the risk? that something untoward is going to happen? But there has to be a reason for the dog sniff. In this case, there has to be a reason why they called for the dog, because there was no evidence that Mr. Crowler had done anything. Well, no, we, but we know they can do the sniff without having a reason. Don't we know that? They can do the sniff. In this case, the sniff was a detour from the actual Well, I understand. You, know, you think they went somehow beyond the scope, yes. well, the proper scope. I understand yes. that that's your argument. But we know they don't need a justification. Once they've got somebody stopped, they don't need, uh, on the uh, on the side of the road. They don't need a justification for uh, a separate justification for doing the sniff, right? In this case, they needed a separate justification for doing the sniff. So you're uh, you're basically asking us to ignore the record and how we how we find the case in terms of the idea that it wasn't unnecessarily prolonged. You're asking us to ignore the categorical rule from MIMS. You're asking us to ignore the categorical dog sniff rule so that we can reach this insane result that says that an officer under these circumstances can't take this minimal safety precaution. I'm asking this court to uphold MIMS and Rodriguez, which I think both apply to the specific facts of this case. If there are no further questions, thank you. I just want to touch on two 
brief points. Uh, Justice LaBarga, I'll just note that your hypothetical that you posed to my friend rests on the idea that the stop has actually ended, and here, of course, the stop had not ended. And just to provide some clarity for what we think Rodriguez holds. No, the, the reason I mentioned that is that the, once a canine officer arrived, there were additional factors to consider as far as officer security. He mentioned, Diaz didn't, he mentioned the fact that uh, in, in his experience as a canine officer, people have a tendency to drive away and, and endanger him and the dog. I was actually helping you. Yeah, no, 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 that, and we're happy to take the help. I mean, that, that's absolutely well, right. And this just gets at the idea, of course, that um, tr safety concerns can present themselves. It may not have been my intention to help you, but I was actually helping you. <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll take all the help I can get. Uh, and, and, and it does just hit on the point that uh, safety concerns can, of course, arise in the middle of a traffic stop, and that's why NIMS's rule is articulated as broadly as it is. Unless this court has any further questions, the, this court should cross the second district's decision. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a short break, break and then be back for our final case for today. All rise. Thank you. 
feedback of the testimony of all the eyewitnesses and ear witnesses to both shootings. So we know the deliberations uh, were a focus on either premeditation or self-defense. Also, just before deliberations, a juror sent a note to the judge asking if the DSM-5 would be in evidence. Of course, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which the expert witnesses had relied on in their testimony. So we know that at least one juror was affirmatively interested in the insanity defense. The jury was out for five hours in guilt phase and five hours in penalty phase. There were no easy decisions for them in this case. And that's why the closing argument problems in both phases and the jury instruction problems in both phases matter. Uh, in close, uh, there were three objections to the penalty phase closing that have carried forth into the appeal. The point is preserved as to all three comments. Uh, two of our objections were overruled. The third was sustained, but counsel followed up with a motion for curative instruction, which was denied. If those rulings are erroneous, those rulings denying overruling our objections and denying the curative, if they are erroneous, then the state's burden in this appeal is, of course, to show beyond a reasonable doubt that the verdict in penalty phase was unaffected by the objected to argument. Uh, the first argument we objected to in closing was you tr uh, try your best to reach a unanimous verdict. <laughs> Now, counsel and I uh, have disagreed on exactly what was said. Uh, it was a long sentence. At the beginning of the sentence, a uh, state attorney says, you have an obligation to give meaningful consideration to everything, and not only that, but, try your best, but to try your best to reach a unanimous verdict. Uh, it's my position that they may well have heard you have an obligation to reach a unanimous verdict. At the very least, they heard it is the prosecutor's personal preference that they try to reach a unanimous verdict. Uh, and, and there was a contemporaneous objection to that. Yes, Your Honor, to uh, incorrect statement of law. And that was, that was not only overruled, but in defense closing, in closing, when defense counsel tried to readdress the matter, he said, uh, uh, jurors, uh, the, your instructions are contrary to what you heard there. There is no obligation for you to act as one. Objection by the state sustained. So the jury came away with the impression that this was perfectly proper argument. And uh, the only case law I can think of that the state attorney could have been thinking of is Allen v. U.S. from 1896. But uh, that uh, the Allen charge has been softened over the years. It's been tempered so that the jury does not feel pressured. In any event, an Allen charge cannot be given, according to this court, in you penalty think that phase. You think that constituted an Allen charge to the jury? Oh, no, Your Honor. The, the underlying, the, the, any, the, the only conceivable law I can think of underlying the argument was Allen v. U.S., which okay, just but, doesn't but apply. The allegation is not in penalty that, that, phase. The, that the court gave the jury in sustaining, in overruling that objection. Your, is it your position that the court gave the jury an Allen charge? No, Your Honor. Closing argument? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Sure it's, it's, it's my position that Allen doesn't apply, that there is no law supporting giving this argument, and that there's a great deal of law that opposes it. Uh, everything from Lockett versus Ohio on down through uh, Abdel Kabir versus Quarterman uh, from the U.S. Supreme Court says that uh, the state cannot or as, as uh, likewise the court, it cannot we, interfere with that. If we uh, agree that it was error for the court to overrule that uh, objection and or to give no curative statement, uh, does it constitute harmful error, and if so, why? Because the argument violates Romana versus Oklahoma, which is what's left of Caldwell versus Mississippi. Uh, in Romano, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the jury cannot be misled as to its responsibilities in a penalty phase in a capital case. Uh, our, our position is that the, the it constitutes fundamental error. I don't know, Your Honor. It's uh, objected to in this case. Okay. Could could have been. Could have been. I guess. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is. You know, we have to decide if, if, if the error you're complaining of is in fact error, then the next question is, was it harmful? Indeed, that's the first question, uh, because if it isn't harmful error, then it doesn't really get us anywhere. Why is this harm? Why does the error that you're focused on right now, why does that constitute harmful error? Because the jury cannot be misled about its role in the process. And what was the impact on the evidence considered by the jury, and how did it make the conviction uh, not, subs not supported by the evidence. Because a juror may well have been intimidated into believing that since the judge had once uh, sustained an objection and once overruled an objection to this argument that it was perfectly okay, that in, it may have, they may have felt that their instructions did not give them the whole story.
and that they are, they do have some obligation to act as one, which they do not. They, uh, the, each juror in a, a capital penalty phase must individually weigh the mitigation, and nothing can come between the jury and the mitigation. The second argument uh, that we objected to early on in penalty phase uh, came in the context in the context of a discussion whether one of the statutory mitigators had been shown. And that was the statutory mit mitigator, whether there was substantial impairment to defendant's capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to conform his conduct to law. The state had admitted that the defense was entitled to an instruction on that statutory mitigator. The argument made was, you all have already made this determination by rejecting his insanity defense. You determined that he knew right from wrong. Uh, the, uh, in, in the brief, I've cited cases where the judge in the sentencing order cannot say, well, I'm not going to consider the mental health related statutory mitigators because I already rejected the statutory, or the jury already rejected the insanity defense. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the state seeks to distinguish those cases. I don't see why it's any better for the jury to be encouraged to believe it doesn't have to address a, mitig a statutory mitigator. The, um, the, uh, st the state further argues that any error is harmless because the judge found the statutory mitigator absent. Our mental health related evidence clearly did not land with the judge at all. That's no indication how it landed with the jury. And uh, I don't believe that uh, the state's going to be able to show this was harmless because of Beck versus Alabama from the U.S. Supreme Court where they held that a reliable penalty phase verdict does not exist unless the reviewing court can be confident that the jury gave independent weight to the mitigation. Much later in closing, toward the end, uh, we uh, different kettle of fish, a sustained objection. This is the one where we asked for the curative. Uh, the argument was that the defendant is serving life sentences. Another sentence of life would be just another piece of paper in Mr. Lloyd's file. The question is, is the murder of Lieutenant Clayton the same or so much more? Uh, state takes the position that the state was just explaining why the aggravation was weighty. Our position is that the state on this record was arguing a non-statutory aggravator. And I've acknowledged this court's Globe case in uh, the reply brief. That was the case, that, in, that, in that case, uh, Globe killed his cellmate. And the judge found in his order that uh, the fact he was serving a life sentence made the statutory aggravator of fact the crime is committed while under sentence of imprisonment it's very weighty. Uh, this court held that, well, he referred to an existing life sentence, which is not a statutory aggravator, but it was really just an aspect of his analysis that the statutory aggravator was weighty. Uh, here, uh, the connection is not as clear that uh, the, the, a prior a filing, a felony, of course, can take place without five life sentences. Our position is that the state now, did it, rely it, impermissibly. Let me, let, let me ask you, that, did the ju uh, jury know independently of this comment uh, that the life sentences existed, that he was under a life sentence? Oh, yes. They knew that? Yes. Okay. Uh, the statement, the, and the state statement is true, but that's, of course, not the end of the inquiry. They can't come in and say, well, you know, we, we uh, uh, review these cases very carefully. But if they, if they knew it already, the, the impact of it, it's like, well, they're telling them something they already know. We, uh, we asked for a, a curative, which consisted of disregard, and uh, we think we were entitled to that, disregard any effort to, to denigrate a life sentence. Uh, but it's, hard I, I, to see, I, it's hard to see the harm if it's something they already know. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> well, as to the entire I mean, point. Because, you, you know, the, you've got to presume that they can add two plus two, okay? That, they can. It's but, kind of the uh, acknowledgement of something that is obvious. The, but, but there's got to be some kind of aggravation for the, for the state to be arguing. They've got no business arguing non-statutory aggravators. They can argue the mitigation is weak. They can argue the statutory aggravation is strong. They're pretty much limited to that. And they came in and said, uh, is, uh, is her death nothing? Well, I'm talking about the harm. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm talking about how you can actually think this is going to uh, have any impact on the way the jury is processing all this. I think the point as a whole, the three arguments taken as a whole, uh, created significant harm. And it is, and I, I also believe uh, that the briefs establish that it's the state's burden to establish no harm. I understand. I understand the state has that burden. 
And there was a guilt phase uh, argument as well as, uh, I'm sorry, not in, in the trial court. We, in the briefs, we have also raised an argument as to guilt phase closing. This is the only fundamental argument that we uh, had to reach for, basically, in the appeal. There was a multitude of objections, if you've read the trial. Uh, the, um, the argument was a sort of musing by the state attorney to the effect that premeditation under Florida law is an extremely broad concept and that it's satisfied by slapping a mosquito instead of brushing it away because the intent is present during the act. That's what he said. The, um, the mosquito swatting analogy misstates well, the law. Didn't the comment actually make it sound like the, the uh, that at least potentially sound, one of the aspects of the comment made it sound like the intent was actually formed during the act? That is what he said. The, and, the, the, that, and that's a misstatement because the, the, um, the statute just refers to premeditation. The case law is, the cases are legion that define what premeditation is and is not. Um, well, it, isn't the law that it has to be, uh, the intention has to be formed prior to the act? Absolutely. But then it has to be present during the act. Correct. Okay. This was cherry picking is, is, is what we objected. There's, in, in the standard jury instruction on premeditation, uh, there's five sentences, four of them emphasize that there's got to be premeditation before the act, and the fifth of, or the, I think it's the second of the five sentences, says it's got to be present during the act. So just taking it in isolation is, we submit, misleading. Now, fundamental error this court holds has recently reaffirmed in the Ritchie and Smith cases cited in the brief that um, fundamental error can be found in two circumstances. Uh, first, where the verdict couldn't be reached without the aid of the error, and second, where the interests of justice would be served by correcting the error. Um, uh, it's, oh, I, I, have to, uh, I have to concede that we cannot meet the former. We can't meet the former. In a case of improper argument, it's going to be virtually impossible for us to ever to meet that standard. That standard originated in jury instruction cases, when if the jury is directed away from a possible route they could have gone, then the, uh, that's easy to reach a, a decision, or it's possible to reach a decision that the verdict couldn't have been reached without the aid of the error. But with, uh, with uh, closing argument, we, j we, we, we just can't re meet that standard because we can't crack the jurors' heads open. There's a rule against it. I submit the interest of justice would be served here be because we know uh, premeditation was disputed. We know the jury was well, interested but, but in don't, it. But don't we also know that the instructions to the jury contain multiple uh, instances of uh, the legal instructions on um, what premeditation consists in. Like, because of, because of the number of different crimes here, it, it's like the jury was getting it multiple times, correctly stated by the judge. We know that. The instructions were correct, yes, Your Honor, and they were repeated. And, and, and they were, uh, how many times, maybe four? Was it four? I can't remember, uh, I think he's got, I think three. I think three of the Three offenses. or four. The anyway. carjacking, I believe, okay. carried life, the assault did not. Um, but felony murder was not an aspect in this case, so there's no fallback there. Uh, I, I submit there's a risk here that this very memorable mosquito swatting analogy, this very you know, snappy argument, made its way into the jury room, and I submit this court should, should hold that uh, its confidence in the verdict is undermined in the guilt phase verdict, and that the interests of justice would be served by correcting the error. But it now was not that, now that comment was with respect to the instructions uh, or, or the crime against Captain Carter, correct? It was made during the discussion of that crime. It was right. made during that, but it's your position that it affects everything else. Yes, Your Honor, because the comment wasn't limited. That, that, that is my position. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not only closing, but also the jury instructions that created a risk of an unwarranted verdict in both phases. In each phase, the defense argued unsuccessfully for a change to the standard jury instructions. We've argued in the appeal that the uh, uh, objected to uh, instructions were confusing in the guilt phase and inaccurate in the penalty phase. And it's also our position that review of these orders uh, should be de novo because those arguments raise questions of law. As in penalty phase, uh, we objected specifically to the uh, statement in, that's been in the closing instructions since 2018, which is, it is the defendant's burden to prove that one or more mitigating circumstances exist. Uh, the state addresses a different argument. Uh, it, for many, many years, uh, the in standard instructions uh, talked in terms of whether the mitigation outweighed the aggravation. In 2017, that was swapped to where we're happy now. We're not saying anymore that that is, in effect, a burden shifter. 
our argument is that the um, Florida legislature has never clearly uh, created a situation where there's any burden on the defense in penalty phase closing. We know from Walton versus Arizona that they may do so, but they have not done so. If, I, if you look at every single version of 921.141 and its predecessor back to 1972, back to Furman versus What's Georgia. What's the actual language of the statute on mitigation? There shall be a weighing of the aggravation and there shall be a weighing of the aggravation vis-a-vis -vis the mitigation. Does that answer your question? I, I, I Is don't. that all it says? I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry, Your Okay, Honor. that's fine. That's fine. Um, the, 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 the specific language we objected to only dates to 2018. Until 2009, the standard instructions allowed jurors to find mitigation sufficiently established if they were reasonably convinced that it existed. And uh, uh, in Campbell versus State in 1990, uh, this court uh, noted that mitigation must have been reasonably established by the evidence. We have no problem with any of that. I, I realize I argued in the brief that Campbell. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Reasonably established. What does that? Re reasonably established. Thank you, Your Honor. How would you reasonably establish something? It could be reasonably established in each individual juror's mind by something that took place in aggravation, by but something that was argued in aggravation. But isn't that consistent with the preponderance of the evidence? I'm sorry. So that's so that's uh, so. What would that be? What standard of proof would that be consistent with? Oh, I don't believe there is a standard of proof. I believe that in the absence of any language placing one on the defense, there isn't one in sentencing. The U.S. Supreme Court. You don't think that's implicit in that? Not necessarily in this context. Very much so in the trial context, but not so much in penalty phase, because the um, the st the state shows the circumstances of the offense. We show the defendant's background and diagnoses. A, a lot of mitigation is going to come up during the defense case, but uh, the weakness in the aggravation is itself mitigating. Mitigating, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, is a super broad concept which consists of anything that might reasonably make a jury. But it's got to be client. established. It's, it's, it's got to be established. It's, we we have just, no objection just, to the old language. It can't just be asserted. Correct. Correct. So if, if once you once you uh, concede that it's got to be established, which obviously you have to concede. You know, you've got to have some standard for determining whether it's established. It just seems to me, and unless it's just totally arbitrary, it's a, the, the statutory language I think is found to exist. So, isn't preponderance the lowest standard of proof that the law would recognize? If so yes, it's it fine, is. So found, so it's implicit. Yes, it is. But it's our position that much mitigation arises from the inconsistencies and weaknesses in the uh, uh, purported aggravation. And that uh, this, we especially object to this language in, in, in the current cases because it, 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 the language has morphed from if you find they've been reasonably established to it is the defendant's burden. I'm, I am very worried that this language is going to lead jurors to think, well, uh, we didn't believe anything out of their mouths. We hate them by now. It's, they didn't prove anything believable. It could happen. Um, it is, and, and if they're confronted with language saying, it is the defendant's burden to prove that one or more mitigating stand circumstances exist, they may say, well, the burden wasn't met. So death. I'm, a, I'm very much afraid that's the case. Uh, we ask the court to um, return to its former language uh, regarding reasonably established. You could say by either party. Uh, it's also our, opinion, our, our, our argument that structural analysis, structural error analysis should apply here. Uh, I'm relying on Sullivan versus Louisiana. Mr. Sullivan was convicted in Louisiana before the U.S. Supreme Court invalidated that state's reasonable doubt instruction. The question when his case got to the Supreme Court was, can that error be harmless? And Mr. Justice Scalia, writing for the court, said no, because there's no way to gauge the effect on the jury, and they lack an accurate explanation how to apply the law to the facts. It's a necessary aspect of jury instructions. This court similarly held in Yon versus State that uh, the burden of proof is a necessary aspect of of the proof in a criminal case. In, uh, Jan was a pre-1999 case where insanity was raised as a defense. That's back when the state and defense split the burden of proof on uh, what is insanity. And uh, that was not made clear in the standard instruction and this court reversed. If, if harmless error analysis applies, then Beck versus Alabama applies. If a jury instruction enhances the risk uh, 
of an unwarranted verdict, it presents an Eighth Amendment problem. And uh, finally, as to guilt phase, our objection to the standards was to the definition of clear and convincing as it applied to the insanity defense. The statute says insanity uh, must be proved by the defense these days uh, by clear and convincing evidence. Uh, we have no objection to the definition of clear in the statute, uh, in, in the jury instructions. That definition is a precise, explicit, and lacking in confusion. Well and good. Our objection is to the definition of convincing because it can, it can, the, the insanity jury instruction, which dates, I believe, to 2006, uh, recites only one of the traditional hallmarks that this court has, the, the, court, the Florida courts, have given to convincing. Uh, the, the, what the, stat, the jury instruction says is that evidence is convincing if it is of such weight that it produces a firm belief without hesitation. What some other jury instructions say is that convincing evidence is that which makes it highly probable that the fact at issue has been proved. And uh, another thing that the courts say uh, in, some, in the civil, civil theft instruction in particular is that the standard is an intermediate one that falls between a preponderance and beyond a reasonable doubt. As I pointed out in the briefs, this court frequently, when it affirms or uh, overrules the action of the JQC, will recite that the, it looks at a clear and convincing evidence standard and will recite every time that that's in between preponderance and beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's done, I assume, because it's important for the, court, the, the public to understand why their locally elected judges are being uh, treated in this fashion. Uh, uh, either highly probable or the standard is an intermediate one, I think intuitively, immediately explains what convincing means well, to the I mean, jury. Counsel, I'm, I struggle with understanding how telling a jury that it's an intermediate standard is really helpful to the jury. Um, I think I, it's extremely helpful. It, 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 uh, it, uh, it, but the, because the problem with the, the producers because then you, because then, you, because what you, then you've got to explain the other standards. And so you're talking about, you're talking about three different standards and then, like, and it just it, it just kind of grows. It seems like to me because just saying it's an intermediate without explaining what the other the other poles are doesn't really tell you anything. You would have to explain the other poles. And so the civil instruction committee has decided in the civil theft statute when they say yes, if there if more than one standard of proof uh, prevails in this case, yes, explain them both. Make sure the jury understands. In a capital case, it's certainly important. I think, that the jury understand where it's going. Uh, again, we're arguing structural error analysis should apply. Well, I understand, I understand you have to tell them what the, the burden of proof is and explain it to them, but the idea of telling them that it's intermediate is, is what I, I question. But what, okay, what it does, let, me, let me try this. It, uh, what it says is it's of such weight that it produces a firm belief without hesitation. That's what the standard jury instruction on insanity says. But the, our, our position is and was that that's too close to the reasonable doubt language, which is that your doubts are reasonable if your conviction that the defendant is guilty is not stable, but one which va wavers and vacillates. Both of those chunks of language get the jury to think, well, if I thought it right away, it must be true. I submit it's not even particularly good advice. If harmless error analysis applies, uh, again, Beck versus Alabama applies, and recall that a juror did ask about the DSM. Uh, the state takes the position that the court should substitute its judgment for that of the jury, uh, because uh, they, they take the position that, well, this is a very weak case for insanity. But uh, again, I'll rely on Sullivan versus Louisiana, where uh, the court wrote that uh, the wrong entity would, in that situation, be deciding the issue. And given the high risk factors I've identified as to both phases, I ask this court to hold the state's feet to the fire. Thank you. Good morning, may it please the court. This is a very interesting case. Uh, there are a lot of issues with the prosecutor's comments uh, that I'd like to start with. Uh, you know, she went into the prosecutor's com comments, the burden shifting. Um, you have an obligation to try your best to reach a unanimous verdict. Defense counsel says this was a misstatement of the law minimizing the role of jury plays. The state's response was 
the prosecutor never used the word obligation, but rather that they try their best. And again, what the prosecutor was obligating the jury to do was to meet, give meaningful consideration to everything, to follow the law, to follow the directions, to come to their verdict. In this case, it was taken out of context. And what the prosecutor actually said is you all sat and listened to the multiple steps you have to take in order to reach a lawful verdict. You have duty to deliberate in this case. And there's been discussion during jury selection and at multiple times during the trial about what it means to deliberate. And while it is true, as you've been told several times, that your decision as to whether or not a sentence of death is appropriate is an individualized decision, which he let them know, that's nothing new to you. And that is something you have already done because what the instructions and the law tells you is that each of you must reach an individualized decision. The prosecutor was very clear on that when he was speaking to the jury. I would suggest to you that you have an obligation to give meaningful consideration to everything. And not only that, but that you try your best to reach a unanimous verdict. And this is when the objection took place and it was overruled. I say that knowing that you all may unanimously decide that Mr. Lloyd deserves life in prison without parole. It's an important decision that you will make, understanding that it is an individualized decision. There was nothing wrong in the statement that the prosecutor made to the jury. It was made in the sense of following the jury instructions, their obligation to follow the jury instructions, and to try to reach it. A verdict. If you do find that it was error, it was harmless. It was a single isolated comment that on the whole asked the jury to reach a death recommendation based on the evidence. The jury was properly instructed by the court, including the fact that a unanimous verdict was not required. that was required, sorry. And so defense counsel in their closing argument, again, stressed to the jury, you can actually without question find that the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating factors. And we, the jury, unanimously find that the defendant should be sentenced to death. If one juror, even if they believe the aggravators outweigh the mitigators, they don't have to vote for death. For a death sentence to occur, it has to be all 12 unanimously. And when you go back there, you make a decision. It is your decision. One juror is a life verdict. End of story. The jury was well versed on what the instructions were, what the responsibility was. Defense also accuses the prosecutor of arguing that there was no need to address the statutory mitigating circumstance regarding the defendant's capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct. Now, the comment was not improper because he was attempting to rebut the mitigating circumstance argued by the defense. And again, his statement was taken out of context. What he actually said was, so the next mitigating circumstance I want to talk about is the allegation that Mr. Lloyd's capacity to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or conform to the requirements of law was substantially impaired. And my recollection is that the only testimony came from Dr. Colino, and it came at the end, and he was asked a specific question, and he clarified that in his view, Mr. Lloyd understood and appreciated the criminality of his conduct. So in that full sentence, he was asking the jury to remember the testimony from Mr. Colino and that even he could not find that he did not understand what he did. Now, the statement that they're talking about comes after that. And here again, you have already made the determination by rejecting his insanity defense. 
you determined that he knew the difference between right or wrong. The state is free to argue against the mitigation in this case. He then went on to argue why there was no evidence. And it's, it's a whole speech about why the mitigation was not met. It was not in any shape or form a way of telling the jury to disregard the mitigation that the defense was trying to present. In fact, he urged the members to use the recollection of the evidence introduced at trial in order to see whether or not that mitigator was proven. And even if the comment was improper, any error is harmless. There's no reasonable probability that that contributed to that sentence. The facts support the jury's rejection of this mitigator, that the defendant knew what he was doing that day, that after killing his girlfriend and her unborn child, he hid in the woods, that he went to the Walmart, and when he saw the police officer and she told him to stop, he knew why he was being told to stop. In fact, he was wearing a bulletproof vest, so he knew what the consequences would be if he was caught. And ultimately, Ms. Lieutenant Klain paid the price for that. When he fled the scene and was encountered by the next officer, he knew again what he was doing. And he knew that he was not going to go back to jail, and he attempted to murder that officer. And he continued to flee. So the actions demonstrated by Mr. Lloyd before, during, after this show that he understood the consequences of his actions, and he knew what he was doing. As far as the comment regarding the two life sentences, as defense stated, the jury was well versed on this. They knew that he was already sentenced to life. And the comment was a very brief portion of the state's entire closing argument. And I know they compare it to the case in Spivy. And much like the slap on the wrist comment, there's not a reasonable probability that the figurative language used here changed any of the outcome of the case. And again, any error would be harmless, because it is very, very unlikely that a different sentence would have been imposed had that comment not been said. As far as claim three, the premeditation shown to exist during the act, uh, defense counsel states or cites to read v. state, uh, this was not an incorrect jury instruction, but a closing argument. And again, viewing the comment not in isolation, but in the entire context, uh, what he said was not improper. The jury instruction, first of all, was on a screen behind him that the jury could read as he was making his closing argument. And what it, the jury instruction says is the decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. What he said was, you look down a mosquito, you see it, what do you do? There's a ch conscious choice in your mind to do one or the other. And it may take a matter of seconds to make that decision, but if you smack it, that's an intent to kill that was formed in your mind at the time and during the actual act. Now, is, isn't that a little misleading? Because it, it, if you, if you, doesn't it uh, suggest that the intent is formed during the act? When he says it there, the way he says it is, the mosquito is there and you're looking at it, and before you smack it, you're making that conscious choice of what am I going to do? Am I going to let it fly away or am I going to smack it? And he follows that up with you make that choice and you smack it. And as the jury instruction says, it's also present at the time of the killing. Um, so when he says at the time of the act it was formed in your mind prior to you thought about it, you decided to kill the mosquito and it's still present during the, the act, which is what the jury instruction says. And even if you were to find that that was an incorrect statement, he follows that up with actual 
facts from the case. He tells them. He doesn't just give this example and leave it out there. He says, and again, the state said that this was really only to, to uh, count two, which was the officer uh, where he attempts to kill him. He follows this example with facts of the case, and he tells the jury, do you remember when the testimony was the officer pulled in, Lloyd was already there outside, outside of his car waiting, standing there. And Officer Clayton pulled in, parked his car, started to step out of his vehicle, and Lloyd took the gun and pointed at him. He had a conscious choice to make to flee, to get back in the car, but he was there laying in wait for that officer to come out. And he shot him. And the circumstances, again, from what just happened at the Walmart, he was not going to go down. He was going to kill before he was caught. So he followed up with the actual facts of the case to show the premeditation. And it is clear from the facts that that was a premeditated act on Lloyd's uh, behalf. I believe that there was also an issue with the insanity instruction. Um, jury instructions are presumed to be correct. And the clear and convincing evidence standard has been around for at least a decade. The defense wasn't asking for a special jury instruction to fit in with any unusual circumstances of the case or because a statute had been changed or for any other reason than to change the definition of clear and convincing evidence to make it a little bit easier. They did not have an issue with precise, explicit, lacking in confusion, which during the closing argument, the prosecutor stated so I would ask you, as the argument is made to you, that you listen carefully to defense counsel's argument, but ask, is there evidence that is clear and convincing that Mr. Lloyd was insane? Is it, to use the language of the instruction, precise, explicit, and lacking in confusion? So the prosecutor didn't even mention the part that they're having an issue with. Now, in order to get a special instruction, you have to make sure that it's a correct statement of the law and not misleading or confusing. Now, they wanted to say that the defendant's claim is highly probable. Well, what does highly probable mean but very likely? And a preponderance of the evidence is enough evidence to persuade you that the defendant's claim is more likely than true. So the state's position is that changing that definition to highly probable would be more confusing to the jury than the clear and convincing standard that was actually instructed to the jury and has been upheld to be a correct instruction and has never been um, held to hold it to a higher burden beyond a reasonable doubt. And again, yes, the opinions of the mental health specialist who testified all had inconsistent, contradictory opinions. So it's very unlikely that that change in the instruction would have changed the verdict in this case regarding the insanity defense. The facts clearly established that Marquis Floyd committed cold-blooded murder. He shot Officer Clayton because he wanted to get away, not because he was insane. And I believe the last issue that was discussed was the burden shifting. As Justin Kennedy said, it has to be established by some sort of standard. And it reasonably established by the greater weight of the evidence is the lowest standard there is. And the defendant is in the best position to prove that mitigating, the mitigators in the case. And again, 
this court has repeatedly refuted any issues regarding the burden shifting that's not occurring. And there has to be some sort of standard in order to prove it. Just don't accept it as is. If there are no questions. I actually have a question, and this is on uh, something that was not uh, mentioned in the, uh, the argument, but isn't is briefed. It has to do with the uh, video of the victim impact evidence. Correct. And, and um, in particular, the music. Yes. Um, I, I struggle to understand what probative value music on the video could have. The music video or the, the video montage was about two minutes long and there was music on there. Um, That's why I asked the question. Right. The, the reasoning for it, there was no specific reason other than the victims wanted that to be an accompaniment to it. Um, the judge did look at the video and listen to the music prior to it and determined that it would be admissible. Um, I do understand that there are circumstances in the cases that were cited where music was not the best choice to make. And in those cases, the music went on, the videos went on for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, the music was actually uh, My Heart Will Go On or, or songs that were meant to invoke more sympathy and more passion. And in those cases, the court ruled that it was uh, highly prejudicial. Um, in this case, it wasn't. It was just music background to the pictures that didn't do any more than was already present. The fact that there was music playing did not invoke any more emotion than with the facts of the case. But it sounds, it sounds like you are conceding that the music itself had no probative value, right? It wasn't evidence in the case. It was not evidence All in right. the case. So then Correct. the question then becomes, if it had no evidentiary value, um, was, it, was the zero of that value substantially outweighed by the potential to influence it appropriately, the jury? And it sounds like it takes very little to overwhelm zero. So if it, if it has zero probative value and it has any kind of uh, you know, f effect on the jury. It doesn't have to be my heart will go on. Right. Um, it's clearly there, you know, f to influence the jury. Leaving aside harmless error analysis for just one moment, sure. does the state concede that it's error then to have included the music with the video? I don't concede that. I, I feel like in this day and age, we've gone from just victim impact statements that are just vocal to reading something to pictures and now to music. And even defense conceded that it wasn't so much uh, the music, but that it should only be applicable to musicians or someone who had an affinity for music. So where do we draw the well, line? Because this wasn't music that uh, was particularly identified with um, the victim. No, it was not. It was not like the victim's favorite song, which no. that's in a different, that's that might be in a different, different category. Right. This is just kind of background, background music. This is background music. And what I stroke, now leave aside this question about if it's the, if it's the, the victim's favorite song, because um, that's not before us. Uh, but if it is just background music, I, I struggle, to, I'm just struggling to see what, the, as I said, the probative value of it. I mean, I understand why people might want it, right? But I don't. Uh, but again, this is a, this is not a show. This is about um, um, presenting uh, evidence, victim impact evidence. Correct. Um, and I don't see how in this particular that background music uh, contributes to that. I don't. I, I, if you get to the harmless error question, that's a whole different issue. Right. I understand that. Right. As far as the purpose of it, no, it was not a song that was associated with her or any kind of relevance to that. You know, the, I've been on both sides of this, in prosecuting and defending, involving victims, family on the state side and involving the, uh, the other side and the defense side. And I've never heard of music 
uh, in the impact statement part of the sentencing. Uh, it kind of reminds me is like when we attend funerals and they have a montage of uh, photographs and video clips of the victims and the family and that type of thing. And they always have this background music and it's very effective as far as, you know, playing to our emotions. Correct. I mean, uh, what, even an instrumental, I believe in this case it was just an instrumental right, type of song. Right, just background kind um, of. What, what possible reason other than to draw that type of emotion uh, would it have? Uh, I, I just never, I never, is this something new that started recently, the music? There aren't very many cases that have mm -hmm. done music. Um, mm -hmm. And as I said, the ones that have used music in the background took it to a whole new extreme. Right. Um, but as I said, yes, it's as, I guess as time goes on and, and things evolve, it goes from just a paper to music to videos yeah. to pictures. Um, the fact of the matter is that whether the background music brought out any more emotion than the facts of the officer was killed and seeing those pictures of the officer, you can say they disregarded the music and were intent on the pictures. I mean, not everyone, that's taking the stance that everyone is affected by music. Some people, music has no effect on them at all, just it's background noise and what they were concentrating on was the photos. Should they have used the music? Yes, no, it wasn't really necessary for it, but did it change the outcome of the trial? Was it harmless or not? And the fact of the matter is that whether or not the music was played, the facts of the case are very horrendous. That's what the jury came back with a death sentence on, not because there was music played or not even if there were pictures played. The fact of the matter is that Officer Clayton was gunned down at the Walmart while she was shopping, trying to stop Markeith Lloyd. And it was all captured on video. And he had a chance to let her live because as the medical examiner said, the final shot or the shot that killed her was the neck. He had shot her and she was down and he could have fled the scene and she'd be alive today. But well, he, he didn't. Uh, uh, am I correct in understanding that he actually stood over her? Yes. And administered the final shot. And, right. She was down. He had an opportunity to flee. Well, and I don't he know didn't. that we know whether the neck shot was the final shot. Well, I don't, not that was the fatal shot. Right. But okay. from witnesses that saw the, uh, the incident and captured on film, he went, physically walked over to her and shot her. Right. On this music thing, though, I mean, what. And, and it doesn't seem reasonable to think that it affected the outcome here in this case, but what would be wrong with the categorical rule that just says, unless there's some evidentiary purpose for playing the music, then don't play the music. It, it's not permitted. Because we already have the pain guidelines to see whether or not it would be prejudicial. I think we'd get into a whole new... But that's about evidence. I mean... Whether or not... It so if it's not even if it's not even being used to prove something, then what? I mean, it just seems like systemically it would be better to kind of stop the practice. Now I'm not saying that I'm not saying that it, it affected the outcome here, but I mean, part of what we do in these opinions is you know we say well, X or Y or Z shouldn't have happened. It was it was an error, and it just seems like if it's not if if there can't even if the prosecution couldn't, can't even articulate an evidence-based reason for doing it, then it just shouldn't be permitted, period. What's, what's wrong with that? As far as no music at all, or, yeah. I mean, or it has to be I, relevant to... It has to be, it has to be, you know, some form of, of evidence, some form of an attempt to, you know, where the music is being used to prove something. Okay, or, so you're saying, I guess because the defense said if it had to do, if they were a musician and... You wanted to play yeah, that I as mean, a background. Whether that's at least then you then you get into all the right. arguments about you know does, does is it overly prejudicial right. you know whatever. Right, that would be a case by case basis. As far as the music being played, did it have to be played? No, it really wasn't tied into anything, um, but it also didn't cause any issues on the other side. Um, 
But I think music, as they stated, it, it could be used. I don't think there should be a bright line, complete cutoff that there should not be any music. That's why you have the evidence before the judge, and he sees it. Well, he I, don't, I think that what's not being, I don't think anybody's suggesting a bright line, no music. I think what might be suggested is a is a is a a, a rule that there's no music unless it has probative value of some sort. And I think you can see that this has no probative value. It's just background music. Indeed, it might be a distraction. Right. Um, uh, right. I mean, from this, you know, these from the images that are shown, which in the context of what the jury has heard are, you know, I'm sure are, are very powerful um, and have an impact. But I mean, this victim impact evidence is not meant to have no impact. So, but when there's this element in it that has no that's not really proving anything and not showing anything, I just I've struggled with it. Okay, I, I agree. Um, but in, the, in, <laughs> in this case, um, whether or not it was relevant or not, I don't believe that it impacted the, the verdict in any way. Um, if there are no further questions, the state would respectfully ask that you affirm Mr. Lloyd's sentences and conviction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, for bringing up the victim impact point. I'm in agreement with what I'm hearing, which is that uh, victim impact is meant to emphasize the uniqueness of the victim, so that if the uh, victim had been a concert pianist, for example, you'd expect music reasonably. Uh, I ask this court to uh, join with the appellate courts of Texas, California, Alaska, and New Jersey that were cited in the briefs. Uh, the state did make the argument that, well, the facts were upsetting. That's just why the jury's emotions shouldn't be uh, tweaked in this fashion. The, the verdict should be rest, should rest on the law given by the court and the facts proved by the parties rather than emotion. As uh, Justice Labarga said, echoing the Texas appellate court, it's not a funeral service, it's a sentencing. Uh, and as this court held in Wheeler and as the Supreme Court held in Payne, uh, if, if victim impact becomes an undue focus. Uh, then there's a, a, a due process problem. I ask the court to reverse on the grounds raised today in both guilt phase and penalty phase. Thank you very much. We're adjourned for today.